Uh, sometimes when God does new things, people get nervous, and uh, people uh, like me who teach on the biblical roots of our faith, you know, we get accused of all kinds of things, and that's fine. Uh, it's no big deal. Who cares? But as we go through these, I want to ask you, if all of these things, are they good for Christians? Is it good for a Christian to have a fuller and clearer understanding of the Bible? Amen? Is it good for Christians to learn exciting new insights about the teachings of Jesus? Is there anything anti-Christian about that? Or anti-Jesus about that? Is it good to be able to understand Paul's writings better? Is it good for Christians to have a clear comprehension of God's plan of redemption in prophetic seasons? Is that, is that helpful for Christians? It's a must, actually. Is it good for Christians to become a better follower of Jesus? Those are benefits that we can receive by discovering the biblical Hebraic roots of our faith. And so we're talking about uh, Hebraic. <clears throat> what does it mean? It basically, it means to cross over. And we're following along in your syllabus that you have. Uh, so you can see here on the transparency, on the slides, as well as your syllabus. Hebraic, it just means to cross over. And it refers to the time when Abraham was called by God and he crossed over the Euphrates, right, to the land that God had given him. So in the natural, he crossed over, but also when he crossed over, he did what? He entered into a covenant with the Almighty and crossed over uh, from being a natural man to a spiritual man and became a covenant man in relationship with the one true God. And Christians become part of that covenant through faith in Jesus. Amen? So the phrase biblical, Hebraic, Jewish roots, boy, it's a big tongue-tiding phrase, simply means there was 2,000 years of history and culture and language and traditions and customs that were the roots from which Christianity grew. And so it just sort of makes sense, you know, if you think about it, to understand the New Testament better the way the writers intended we need to study it within the context of its Hebraic Jewish roots. Amen? Does that make sense to you? So let's look at this next slide here. Here's the Apostle Paul. He was a Jewish rabbi, you know. And uh, he wrote so much of the New Testament from a Jewish perspective. And here's what he wrote uh, to the believers in Rome, he says, for whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning. Things that were written before, what is that? In the Hebrew Bible, what we've called the Old Testament, the Tanakh, what was written before was written for our learning. And so the examples for us to learn about walking with God are originally given in the first part of the book that some Christians uh, don't give much uh, credibility to or spend much time reading and studying. You know, there were times in Christian church history when uh, the, the wise councils of the church in Europe almost voted to take the Hebrew Bible out of the Bible because it's that Old Testament Jewish stuff. Whereas Paul says, these things were written before for our learning. And he wrote to these same believers here in Romans 11:18, "Do not boast against the branches, the Jewish people, but if you do boast, it's like he had a heart understanding, a heartache that they would. Remember that you do not support the root, the brick origins of our faith, but the root supports you. Amen. And so, there are many benefits of learning the roots of our faith. And we want to look at these this evening. Number one, as we've already said, a fuller and clearer understanding of the Bible. Two, exciting new insights about the teachings of Jesus. Three, 
clarification of Paul's writings or a clearer comprehension of God's plan of redemption and prophetic seasons. Many believers are not aware that there's even such a thing as prophetic seasons. And so how can they be where God is if they don't know that he moved? <laughs> and they're still stuck where he was and, and he's moved. Amen? So we don't, we don't want to be doing what God did. We want to be doing what he's doing. Amen? What he did was great then. But over time, man takes over that wonderful move of God and it fossilizes into something called religion which can be very boring come on now but to be where God is now is always exciting amen and pegging our senior citizens and what gets us out of bed every morning is because we are in the season of what God is doing now hallelujah in fact we we were in it before anybody else was almost so praise God so we want to look at these just for a little bit here this evening First of all, a fuller and clearer understanding of the Bible. Here's our challenge. As American believers, or some of your, at least North American believers, no way we have some people from Canada here, North American believers, we read the Bible with Western eyes. You know, like Jesus just came in from the beach, you know, he and the boys. And uh, we, we, we think of him, people think, put G, they make Jesus over into their own culture and image rather than making us into his image. Amen? And so we have, a, we have a Western mind and a Western worldview, and you see how difficult it is to understand, for a Western mind to understand the Middle Eastern worldview. You see that with our politicians every day trying to learn how to make some kind of agreement with folks in the Middle East. They, they cannot comprehend the Middle Eastern mind. So we have this Middle Eastern book that we're trying to read with Western eyes. And this causes us a lot of confusion. It's difficult for us to understand Middle Eastern customs and culture and worldview when we look at it with Western eyes. Another concern here is that the Western mind has been influenced more by Greek philosophy, and that's something for a whole other series of courses, than Hebrew or Hebraic thought which is why it's so very important for us to understand the Bible from its Hebraic perspective. Reading the Bible through Hebrew eyes gives us a fuller, richer, and clearer understanding of the Bible. It enlarges, clarifies, and gives detail to the meaning of what we're reading. And I like to give this as an illustration. How many of you are familiar with the three-dimensional drawings they have at the malls? They usually have them out on an easel somewhere, and they're trying to get you to stop at their store and look at something. And if you look at it on the surface, it's just a mumbo-jumbo. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Now, my wife loves these things because she says, Now, honey, you just stay here and look at this for a while and figure out what it is, and, and I'll be back in a few hours. And we know where she's going, shopping. She's doing her natural built-in DNA gift. <laughs> Hallelujah. The gift of shopping. It must be in the Bible there somewhere, you know. Well, women know that. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Hallelujah. From the husband is giving and they're receiving. You've heard the definition of a workshop. That's where the husband works in the wife's shops. Come on, ladies, help me out here. So anyway, they tell you to stare at this thing, and they say, well, just look past the surface, whatever that means. And if you just look at it a certain way, past the surface, look to the de back of it, the depths of it, and, and, you know, who knows what they're trying to explain to you. And you stand there staring at this thing, and maybe you see something, maybe you don't. But in about two hours, Peggy's come back, you know, with all, and it's okay if I see it or don't see it now for her. 
But if you happen to see it a certain way, all of a sudden, what happens? You see all that detail, all that depth, all that richness, that incredible presentation that's beyond the surface. And the reason you're seeing it is because you're looking past the surface. You're seeing it with the eyes of the artist who created that three-dimensional drawing. And it's a matter of perception. And it's the same idea with the Bible. When we look past the surface of the Western cultural thinking and look to the depths of the scriptures in its Hebraic presentation and worldview, all of a sudden, things that we read for many years as Christians that really didn't do anything for us, you know, they weren't too exciting or so, blah, 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 go to the next verse or whatever. All of a sudden, wow, we've looked past the surface, we've looked into the depths of it, and all of a sudden, something that we've read for years is illuminated by the Spirit of God and becomes so real and alive inside us, it changes our lives. Because we're seeing it through the eyes of the writers. We're perceiving it as they perceived it. And so it's important that we read the Bible through Hebraic eyes. Another benefit here is that we learn exciting new insights about the teachings of Jesus. Now, every culture tries to make Jesus over into their image. If you get to travel very much around the world, uh, Jesus uh, is this, he's that. You know, we, we try to make him into an American. Uh, the Europeans think he was a European. Uh, the PLO have tried to make him into a Palestinian. If you go to Hawaii, he, he's Hawaiian. Wherever you go, uh, people claim him f for their own. But in doing that, and praise the Lord for that, they then reinvent him and put him in their culture as one of them. And in doing that, over time, we lose who the real Jesus is. You see? And so... Jesus, Yeshua, you know, his Hebrew name, was a Jew. Hello? Right away, that can cause problems for Christian people who think he was a Methodist. <laughs> well, we all know he was a Baptist because John the Baptist was his helper. And the others, of course, the Catholics know he was Catholic because his mother was a good Catholic. That we have to have fun with each other, right? We have to laugh at our own silliness sometimes. But he's a Jew, and right away that causes some people to be nervous and upset. He was born into a Jewish family, in the Jewish village of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, in the land of Israel. He kept all the laws of God, as well as the customs and traditions that honored God and benefited people. A little qualifier there. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was dedicated to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the temple in Jerusalem. He was raised in Nazareth in a very poor Jewish family. And apparently, if we read it literally, he had four stepbrothers and two stepsisters. And so Jesus was born into the history and culture and customs and traditions of his people. Jesus was a faithful Jewish man. And we see this by how he lived his life in the Bible when he read the Jewish scriptures. He spoke Hebrew. All this is right there in the Bible. He wore Jewish clothes. He, he didn't get them at Foley's. He ate only biblically kosher food. He kept the Jewish Sabbath. He celebrated the biblical feasts. He followed Jewish customs. And this is really shocking to some. He lived his entire life as a Torah, that's Hebrew for law, Torah observant Jew. Jesus ministered as an itinerant rabbi 
to the poor and needy. He performed miracles similar to what other rabbis were able to do, but he did other miracles that ordinary rabbis could not perform. He presented himself as the Jewish Messiah and Savior to the Gentiles. He was rejected as Messiah by a small handful of powerful Sadducean priests who ran the temple. Anybody that's overturning the money changers at the temple is a threat to the livelihood of the folks running the temple. Amen? But he was embraced by many thousands of ordinary Jewish people. And when you get into all of these things, you see that the Jews, quote-unquote, didn't kill Christ. Small handful, probably 50 people, the whole um, country that were running the, I call it the establishment, running things in Jerusalem. He was too much of a threat to them. But the ordinary people loved him and he had tens of thousands of followers. And so Jesus' followers, they were all Jews at the beginning, of course. They worshiped on Shabbat. They attended the synagogue. They celebrated the festivals. They acknowledged Jesus as the Jewish Lord. They wrote the Jewish New Testament. They also lived Torah observant lifestyles. And uh, that was what the root of what Christianity came out of. When the church was taken over by the Gentiles, unfortunately the Jewish believers were forced to deny their own Jewishness and their own customs, their own traditions, their, their own people, and their own heritage, and were forced to, to merge themselves into the emerging Greco-Roman Western uh, based Christian world and church of coming out of Constantine. And so you had a choice as a Jewish believer. You either uh, embrace that which was totally anti-Semitic against your own self and denounce your Jewishness or you practice your Messianic Jewish Hebraic faith in Yeshua in private. Some did that and eventually most of them died out in the fourth and fifth centuries when they passed from the scene. And from that time until late in the 19th century, the New Testament Jewish way of life for Jewish believers uh, basically came to an end. And they, as I said, had to merge themselves into a new Greco-Roman anti-Semitic religious structure really ruled over in the earlier days by Constantine or just disappear somehow into the woodwork, basically. So Jesus and all of his early followers were Jews. They were deeply rooted in their, their rich Hebraic soil. Jesus and the disciples, they didn't just kind of parachute out of heaven one day, and there was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John under their arms, you know, uh, the red letter edition too, no less. And of course, in the King James Version, uh, but no, they were, they were people who were, of course, Jesus had a unique birth, of course, but he and his followers, they were all born into a continuing 2,000-year history of their own people. And so they were rooted in all that had gone before them. Jesus really came as a revivalist. He didn't really come to start a new religion. He came to revive and revitalize and breathe spiritual life into what had become, for many, a dead religion of Judaism. Well, since Jesus and all the folks who wrote the New Testament pretty much, you know, had that background, doesn't it sort of make sense that we can understand the Bible better if we understood them better and know Jesus better if we knew him in his setting then rather than putting him as an American in our Western culture today. 
And so knowing Jesus better. Another benefit here is the clarification of Paul's writings. Now I'm a writer and I know how writers can be misunderstood. But I don't think there's any writer throughout history that's been more misunderstood than the Apostle Paul. Both Christians and Jews believe that Paul was an anti-law Jew who was a sort of a turncoat on his own people and his own faith and established a Gentile brand of Christianity that was different and denied and replaced his own ancient faith. Well, when we study Paul's writings, we see that's not exactly who he was at all. But we have to study him not as if he was writing books at the Christian seminary here in America, but as a Jewish rabbi who saw that Yeshua was the ultimate goal and reality, not replacement of, but the ultimate human embodiment of all the pictures of him in the first part of the book. Amen? And so Paul, thank God, did not require Gentiles to get circumcised. Hallelujah! He didn't require Gentiles to become Jews in order to enter into the covenant of faith. But neither did he say his own Jewish brethren uh, were to toss away and accept some kind of new plan of salvation and way to walk with God. He made a distinction between them. And so, who is the Apostle Paul? He's a Jew also. His name was Shaul, the Hebrew word for Saul. He was born into a Jewish family. It's all in the Bible. We, we just don't read it as it says it, you know. We're filtering it all through our Western eyes. Born into a Jewish family of the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised according to the law. He was a zealous Pharisee. He considered himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. He kept all the customs and traditions of his people. He lived his entire life as a Torah observant Jew. He did himself. Now Paul was a brilliant man and because he was an extraordinary student when he was younger he was taken to Jerusalem to study under his teacher Gamaliel uh, who was the leading moderate Pharisee teacher in Jerusalem of his time. He had over a thousand students we learn in Jerusalem. He was the grandson of Hillel who's considered probably the greatest rabbi in Jewish history and teacher and sage. Uh, and Paul studied under him. Gamaliel had about 1,000 students, as I mentioned, and Paul was at the top of the class. So the guy was brilliant. He was fluent in both Hebrew and Greek. And so he was a Jew, as I said, named Shaul. He was born into a Jewish family of the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised according to the law. A zealous Pharisee, considered himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, kept all the customs and traditions of his people. Now that's a shocker, just to say something like that. All you have to do is read his own words in the book of Acts. Every time he was interrogated, he said, I never did anything against the law of God or the customs of my people. He never changed anything. But he also lived his entire life as a Torah observant Jew. When we realize who Paul was and the background and education he had, certainly we see the need to study what Paul knew, the biblical Hebraic roots of our faith. Otherwise, we're reading Paul's letters as again as if he was a seminary professor here in America teaching Western theology when he was writing out of thousands of years of a Hebraic background and culture. In Acts, we learn that Paul circumcised Timothy, regular attended the synagogue, took a Jewish vow, hurried to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot, Paid for other Jews to offer sacrifices at the temple. Now, that's really a zinger, isn't it? 
claimed to have kept the laws and customs of his people. And because Paul is so often misunderstood, we again read his words with Western understanding of biblical words and what they mean. And Paul, as I said, is accused of being anti-law, but we, we don't understand the biblical meaning of the word law. It just means teaching. It means instruction. It doesn't mean a system of rules and regulations. The word picture is when the mentor teaches the student how to draw the bow and let the arrow fly to hit the mark. That's what the word law or Torah in Hebrew means. It's not in any way related to stop in the name of the law and rules and regulations to govern people's behavior. And therefore, with that biblical knowledge and understanding, Paul said in Romans 12, therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. He says in Romans 7, 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. He says in Romans 7, 22, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Now if you understand the biblical background of what he's talking about in his, in his words, of course nowhere was he ever saying in any way that we were to find salvation by keeping, quote unquote, the law. But the law is teaching, instructing us how to walk with God. The New Testament is full of these wonderful, powerful, liberating statements like, by grace through faith are we saved, not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. Well, where do you think these Jewish writers of the New Testament got those ideas? From the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible. All of those teachings they memorize when they memorize the Hebrew Bible. They're just saying the ultimate reality of all of this is found in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And so Paul was writing as a Jewish man doing his best and very challenged to take Hebraic concepts and write them to Greek thinking and Greek speaking Gentiles. Very, very difficult. In a very small way, of course, not anything compared to him at all, but those of us who try to write books on the Hebraic roots of our faith have the same kind of challenge. How can I say this without somebody misunderstanding? And of course, somebody's going to misunderstand. So you say, have you taken our second course yet? <laughs> you got to take all the whole deal. Get the full meal deal. You can't just have a little piece of french fry and think that you've got it together. Amen? Are you all with me? Okay. So if we study Paul through our Western eyes, we will certainly misunderstand him. Unfortunately, this is what our early church fathers did. And they have passed down their cultural misinterpretations of Paul from one generation to the next, even to our own times. Okay, number four, a clear comprehension of God's plan of redemption and prophetic seasons. Many people just are not aware that God has prophetic seasons. He did something great then, but now he's doing something different now. And he keeps moving forward because he who is outside of time sees the end from the beginning. And from time to time, in time, he reaches down from heaven and does some big spiritual deal that moves everything forward to the next spot. And that's a prophetic season and everything changes. And people get nervous because their traditional deal is no longer the thing he's doing. He's moved on and we all have a choice to 
just dig our heels in and not follow the cloud? Hello? Or follow the cloud? That doesn't mean we undo and do away with everything we've had. No, we take it and go on w with God. We take what he did and carry it forward and move on with him. And <clears throat> that's why we write these books about the feast of the Lord. Prophetic seasons. We'll have a session on that tomorrow. And so let's look at this here for a few moments. Jesus was crucified on Passover. He was buried on unleavened bread. He was resurrected at first fruits. Wow! It's good enough for him. It ought to be good enough for us. He was or did send the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He is going to return at Tabernacle. So all of Jesus' major redemptive actions he did on feast days. That's a pretty big statement. So we want to better understand him and who he is and what he's done and what he's doing. We need to discover his own festivals. Amen? And so these are pictures of a person. I like to try to simplify things for people and say the Hebrew Bible if you can cut away all the gobbledygook and extra talk and filler, you know, the Hebrew Bible is the picture of a person. And the person, of course, is Yeshua or Jesus of Nazareth. God speaks in picture languages. The visuals are in the first part of the book. And so if we sort of have a, a disdain or a negative attitude towards what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and, and don't really think of it as something relevant for our lives, you miss all the pictures. It's like going into a movie halfway through the movie and you won't have any idea who the characters are and their relationships to each other. And so the pictures, the visual aids, that God gave of the Messiah, they're all in the first part of the book in that dusty old stuff that many of us were told God did away with or, you know, it's hard to understand. What are those old rituals and things all about anyway? And, well, just, just give me Jesus. That's all I need. Well, of course he's all you need, but who is he? <laughs> who is all you need? If you don't know the pictures, you might get a distorted view of the person. Hmm. Hallelujah. Now I have pictures of my wife all over the house. Peggy and I have been in honeymoon wedded bliss for over 40 years. Hallelujah. <laughs> I mean I still get my little heart still goes like that. I start sweating you know it's called love you know whenever she walks in the room after all these years. Hello, husbands and wives. I still want to jump up and run around and do a little dance in the living room any time of the day that she might be there. Absolutely. And I have pictures, of course, of her around the house, and she has a few of me, you know. I have a picture of her on my cell phone. Oh, and I look at that phone. There's my wife. I love to look at my wife. That's why I married her. Hallelujah. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? <clears throat> well, when she actually comes from the office to the house, she, bless her heart, works 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week in our ministry offices, about five minutes from her house, and she's a senior citizen, you know, so she, she takes a little longer to do those eight hours worth now. It takes 12 hours maybe. Hallelujah. People in ministry never retire. We just get refired until he comes. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, we don't understand all these retirement plans that our friends have because, you know, our retirement plan is we do it until we drop. Or he comes for us. I take that one first. Amen. Well, when Peggy walks into the house, I don't go run around turning her picture down. 
like I don't want it anymore or don't need it anymore or that oh wait a minute hon stay out in the garage a minute let me go run through the house turn down all the all your pictures because you're here now I love to look at her pictures when she's not there and then when she shows up wow I can do more to look at the pictures hallelujah And so just because the person has showed up doesn't mean we don't need and can't learn from the pictures anymore. See what I'm trying to say to you? But the pictures are in the first part of the book. The Hebrew Bible is a picture of a person. And as I said, Jesus did all of his major redemptive acts on feast days. And, for example, at Passover, it teaches how to find peace with God through Jesus, our Passover lamb. Amen? Unleavened bread and first fruits. The Wesleys re ushered that in. We'll talk that another time. Teach us about unleavened bread and first fruits. Walking in holiness. Putting off the old. Putting on the new. See? All those major moves in the Christian church down through the ages, we'll see later, they were actually God restoring the spiritual reality of the festivals to the people of God throughout the world. I call it a prophetic season. It's moving forward because all of God's prophetic season is based on the feasts, the festivals. Pentecost teaches us how to have the power of God in our lives. To be able to acknowledge Yeshua, Jesus, as Lord Adonai of our lives. Amen. Trumpets teaches us that Jesus is the horn of our salvation. Who has defeated our enemies for us. And how to put him on and wear him as the armor of God in our lives. Hallelujah. You see, it's not some dusty old stuff that's irrelevant. Atonement teaches us about the need for cleansing and purifying and sackcloth and ashes and repentance and all those hard things and the result of the seven feasts is seven steps in our walk with God the end result is tabernacles which the reality of that prophetically is the coming of the Lord but internalizing it today if you're at tabernacles is joy and rest those are the two words that symbolize tabernacles and so all of these things are God's prophetic seasons and we'll talk more about these in in other sessions maybe okay number five become a better follower of Jesus Paul wrote to Timothy the holy scriptures make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Of course, that's the English. He, he wouldn't have said Christ Jesus, you know, Messiah, Yeshua. But this way it comes down to us in English. We're, for the most part, English-speaking people. And so he said, the Holy Scriptures. Well, what was he talking about? They, they didn't have the New Testament then, of course. So he's talking about the Hebrew Bible. The Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, was able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, our Messiah Yeshua, the Messiah in Jesus Yeshua. And so, contrary to being some old irrelevant book, Paul says we can find salvation in all these pictures that point us to the person. And he said to the Romans, all these things were written as examples for us to learn from. If you want to know how bad murmuring and complaining is, look at the book of Numbers. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> if you want to know how not to get into God's promised land of blessings, go look. All those pictures are there and stories are there for us to learn from. Amen? So in the time of Jesus, the Hebrew Bible was divided into three divisions. The Torah, or the Law of Moses, the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is the Psalms. So we had the Torah, 
the prophets and the Psalms. In the first century, as we read the New Testament, all of the Hebrew Bible was divided into those three divisions. Now look what Yeshua Jesus comes along and says about that and himself after he's resurrected. In Luke 24, 44, he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Wow. That might sort of go by us a little bit. But everyone listening to him knew exactly what he was claiming. That the whole of the Hebrew Bible was pictures pointing the people to him. To know him better, then we need to know about that law and psalms and prophets. Amen? Does that make sense to you? And then he said in Luke 24, 45 to 48, it says, He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. So he says the scriptures, which again was the Hebrew Bible, was about the gospel, the good news, that sometime in history God would come in the person of the Messiah as God's son, Psalm 2, several times in the Hebrew Bible, we're told that God has a son. It's not a New Testament revelation. Some of the understandings of him are, of course, because when the person shows up and you've only had the picture, you're going to know the person better. Amen? <clears throat> Again, with my wife, I love to look at her pictures, but I'd much rather give her a big hug in person. Hallelujah. Jesus was saying the scriptures were about the gospel. Remember Galatians 3, 9? God preached the gospel to Abraham? How can that be? He lived a long time before Jesus, you see. All these are pictures of God's eternal plan of redemption. And he also says here, in Luke, after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to two of his followers on the road to Emmaus. They were saddened by his death and didn't recognize him. And after walking with them away, he said, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ or the Messiah to have suffered these things and enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself wow beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So where do you think you should start? With Moses <laughs> and the prophets <laughs> and the Psalms looking for the pictures of the person. And so in Luke 24, 31 to 32. We also have a scripture. It says, Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. 
they knew him. So many of us only know about him. They knew him. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Would you like to have a little spiritual heartburn? You won't need any Rolades or antacid. This is what happened when Jesus showed them the pictures and how they were all about him and how he was the reality of it all. It says their eyes were opened and their hearts burned within us as he talked with us and explained all this to us. And this is what can happen in the life of the Christian person. When we find our biblical roots and, and we see how all of these pictures are about the person, what happens is it opens the eyes of our understanding to the Bible to see it as the writers intended for us to see it. To grasp it from information to revelation to manifestation. And the information gets in our head and the revelation gets in our heart and the manifestation is seen in our bodies and how we live our lives. And it literally explodes inside you with spiritual power that will change your life forever. And you'll never be satisfied again with where you used to be with God and what God did, but you'll want what He's doing in your life now. The whole of the Bible will open to you. I've been teaching on these things for over 30 years. We've had, you know, a lot of students around the world. And they all say the same thing. I feel like I've been born again and again. And my passion for Jesus is renewed. I was stale, but now I'm returning to my first love. Hallelujah. I'm excited. The Bible's come alive to me. I want to go tell everybody how wonderful Jesus is. That's pretty good fruit. That's not trying to turn Christians into Jews and put somebody, quote unquote, under the law, using the Western meaning of those words. It's helping them renew their passion for the real Jesus. It says they knew him. And so discovering our biblical roots will help us to know him. Who he is. What he meant when he used all those figures of speech that are so hard for us to understand. We, we try to understand him as if he's teaching at the seminary here somewhere in America, you know. He's a itinerant rabbi using rabbinic methods of teaching of his time that the people could relate to. And so many of his teachings using these figures of speech, we can't understand them too well if we try to filter them through American ways of talking and thinking. And we have whole religious organizations, not in any way to be critical, that are formed and, and have a doctrine and theology and practice on reading Jesus' Jewish phrases as if they were Western phrases. One, for example, like, turn the other cheek. 
And so we have whole groups and movements of Christians who said, well, we're pacifists, we're supposed to turn the other cheek. But we're not realizing that was a figure of speech, which meant if your neighbor turn, tears down your fence, don't go tear down their fence. It didn't mean let them burn the house down too. It, 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 it means don't go take personal vengeance against somebody that's harming you. It doesn't mean if somebody's coming into your house to rape your wife and kill your children, husbands, that you better get out the gun and blow them away. Of course, I'm from Texas. <laughs> you see what I'm trying to say here to you? Here's just one little statement. Turn the other cheek. That whole groups of people translated it to mean pacifists. You're not supposed to defend yourself. You're not supposed to fight. Well, of course you are. If you won't defend your own family, you're worse than an infidel. There's evil in this world. Evil has to be fought against. And Einstein, I believe, he said that the ills of this world that concern him are not because of the evil in the world, but because of good people who don't do anything about it. See? We have to do something about it. We have to fight for what is right. And so, you know, I'm, I, I don't have a gun on me here. I don't have a permit, you know, so don't get nervous. So I'm not a spokesman for the NRA or anything like that. I'm just saying here is just one statement from Jesus that whole groups of Christians have misunderstood and based their whole way of life on it, you see. And there's dozens of more like that. And so it's very easy to misunderstand a lot of that part in red in the Bible if we try to read it from a Western mindset. And these, tomorrow we'll get into some of these things in more detail.